Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. And I want to continue where we left off yesterday in this most remarkable book, Code Word Barbalon, 666 Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. This is book one of a book of a two book series by P. D. Stewart. The second the book is shortly to uh, hit the racks, and I highly recommend both of these books. Obviously, I haven't read the second one yet, but I'm told that it deals with 9-11 and the economic collapse, and it's going to be very, very enlightening and forming information for God's people. And uh, this book, Code Word Barbalon, I'm, this must be the third or fourth time that I've read through this book. And I read this for my participants on amateur radio to help enlighten them about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order, a concept that people aren't familiar with and uh, need plenty of uh, plenty of substantiation to the claim. And that's what this book does: uh, copious substantiation to the idea that the Jesuit. Vatican controls our government and that of the governments of the world. And it's supported in Scripture, plainly evident in the Scripture. The thesis that this book makes is put forth in the Bible, particularly Revelation chapter 17, where it says, All the kings of the earth have given their power and strength unto the beast. They're all of one mind, and they make war against the Lamb of God. And uh, this book shows in history how the Vatican papacy has made war against the saints of God. And one of these war-making uh, strategies was to blow up pro- a Protestant parliament in Great Britain. We've been talking about the gunpowder plot of 1605 and how a Jesuit priest, Henry Garnett, was tried, put forth a miserable defense, claiming the sanctity of the confessional as a defense in in order to keep this plot secret that the entire British Parliament building and the parliamentarians and the king would be destroyed. Immediately there to follow would be an invasion from Roman Catholic Spain and a forcible overthrow of the government and a reestablishment of Catholicism on the English throne. And we, we, at the end of the broadcast uh, yesterday, we made it clear that Henry Garnett has been made a saint of the Roman Catholic Church for this effort. He's been canonized in the Roman Catholic Church for the fomentation and the conspiracy called the Gunpowder Plot of 1605. Now, I want to back up a a paragraph for continuity purposes this morning for the listeners and also especially for those who are listening in the archives, the subscribers. None of Garnet's actions should surprise us, as it was the founder of the first general of the Jesuits, Ignatius Loyola, who mined all such treasures of Jesuit sophisms. On Ignatian principles, a Jesuit could justify any act by convincing himself that it was for the greater glory of God, ad majorum dei glorium. Ignatius Loyola wrote, quote, It would be greatly advantageous, too, not to permit anyone infected with heresy to continue in the government, particularly the supreme government of any province or town, or in any judicial or honorary position. Now, does that explain some of what we see going on in politics today in Washington, D.C.? Assassinations, John F. Kennedy. But this, this, this quote from Ignatius Loyola goes all the way down to provinces and towns. Might you ever recognize how there seems to be a force operating in your town that you just can't put your finger on? 
you might investigate just how much influence the priest of your local Roman Catholic Church has in, in city council and government affairs, local city government affairs. And I think you'll uncover what I've uncovered in this locality where I live. Street-level control. And that's how they're going to overthrow this country. It's not a pipe dream. It's documented in history. And I'm not talking about something that happened in 1605, just some acuity in historical knowledge. No, we're reviewing this history of the Jesuits so that we might better perceive what they will do and what they are doing in this country today. We're studying history so that we can understand the present. Keep that in mind. We're not just reviewing history to become historians. This is an analysis of what ails America. And we first discover what the Jesuits have done throughout history, and then we can better understand what happens in our country today. Because remember, the Jesuits were repeatedly kicked out of England. But the United States has never laid a glove, never made an accusation against the Jesuits. They operate with the full freedom protected by their so-called sovereign status as belonging to the, the independent sovereign city-state of Vatican City. They're agents of a hostile enemy foreign power, the, the Antichrist power of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. They have no loyalty to this country. They have no familial ties no land ties, no loyalty to the Constitution. As a matter of fact, they're sworn to destroy our Constitution. And have you noticed that we now have a man in the White House who's not even a natural-born citizen and not qualified under the Constitution to be in the White House? Might we suspect that the Jesuits had something to do with that by destroying our Constitution? I believe that our Constitution has been suspended. They just haven't told us. They have no regard for it. And I think we can explain what's happening in Washington, D.C. by what the Jesuits have sworn to do to destroy all popular government, that is, all governments of, by, and for the people, and to establish a hierarchical government, a top-down government, where the Vatican... Rather, the papacy forms the top controlling authority. And that's exactly what's happening. It explains everything in history. It explains everything in current events. and explains everything that we read in the Bible we weren't sure we could understand. Now it's all clear. There's no reason to question what the Bible says anymore. We see the facts on the ground. Bring to our understanding the words of Revelation chapter 17 and 18 now, and 13, Revelation 13 particularly. Now, Loyola also taught his order such niceties as, quote, wrong is right if it is for the gain of the church, unquote. And also, the motto of the Jesuits, the end justifies the means, by any means necessary. In other words, if the end that is desired brings glory to the Roman Catholic Church or advances her authority and power in the world, then whatever means to achieve that end is meritorious, even if it's diabolical. And that's what the gunpowder treason was. It was a diabolical violation of God's law and the sanctity of life and the legally established government, Protestant government of Great Britain, to destroy it with one explosion, 36 kegs of dynamite in the basement, to literally in one fell swoop knock out the entire Protestant government and to begin a land invasion, a forcible takeover to bring England back under the heel of the Pope. You shall know them by their fruits. Let us not forget their fruits, 
so that we may know them. That's why we're reading this book. Now, all of these convenient rules were kept alive. All these maxims, such as ad majorium de glorium, all for the greater glory of God. Whatever brings glory to the Roman Catholic Church is not wrong. It must be right. And the end justifies the means, and by any means necessary. These are basic tenets and teachings of the Jesuit order. And all these convenient rules were kept alive and promulgated after Loyola's death in his constitutions. The constitutions of the Jesuits. Indeed, such adages or maxims repeatedly crop up in almost every Jesuit book. Every book written on the subjects of the Jesuit order, these maxims and adages come directly to the conversation. They are what define the Jesuit order. And it says, and to be sure, these are just a few of the more noteworthy illustrations of the sophistries taught by the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order, a most enigmatic breed of monks, says the author. Of the many other schemes, plots, convulsions, and contrivances they have orchestrated, all for the glory of God, ad majorium de glorium, we shall have much opportunity to speak as we read this book. Much opportunity to speak of how the Jesuits bring glory to the Roman church and what a diabolical glory it is. It's anyone that says, no, nor is any of this a private view or some particular prejudice of mine, says the author, but a public t- care to read and to the world. Now, P.D. Stewart's making it perfectly clear. This book is not the result of some kind of a personal grudge he has, an axe to grind with the Jesuits. This is a carefully researched, studied, and highly documented book, a book of historical facts, a book that cites multitude of sources. This is not a personal view of P.D. Stewart. This is the culmination of a tremendous amount of research. And it, let, let me tell you, being you know, this being the fourth time that I've read this book, I've read many of the books that are cited in this book. And he's telling the truth. Okay? Many, many books written over hundreds of years by as many authors all verify the summations that are made in this book by P.D. Stewart. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is facts on the ground, facts of history, reiterated by numerous authors over over a hundred hundreds of years of time. So we can trust this book. Now it says there's one other murderous scheme. Now we've been talking about the gunpowder plot of 1605. We're going to continue. That's not the only atrocity, by far not the only atrocity that the Jesuits, the Jesuit order has fomented in the world. And, and we're only going to, in this portion of the book, we're only going to touch on a couple more. We just don't want to, just don't want, leave anybody to think that the gunpowder plot was the only treasonous and diabolical thing that the Jesuits have ever done. It says, there's one other murderous scheme which story deserves a passing notice. Having been foiled in their gunpowder plot of 1605, they sought to make good their failure later that century. On January 24, 1679, the procurator for the English Jesuits, William Ireland, made another failed attempt at regicide. In other words, try to decapitate the government by killing the king. He was found guilty and, like Garnett, before him, was put to death in London for plotting to kill the king. These men stop at nothing, says the author. They do not. It is their divine prerogative to bring all lands under the control of the Pope. World domination is the very reason for their existence, and when they stop at that effort, they cease to be Jesuits. 
Now, nor must we forget to mention similar or rather worse instances of Jesuit regicide which occurred in France. In 1593, a Jesuit priest, Auguste Barrier, attempted the life of King Henry IV. In 1594, another assassination attempt was made by John Chattel. The murder of King Henry IV was finally effected by the Jesuit lawyer Francois Ravillac on May 14, 1610, following the Edict of Nantes. Remember, the Edict of Nantes, for those who don't know, was an edict... France was tired of, of religious persecution and the Jesuits' manipulation and subversion of their government and trying to harness the power of the crown to persecute. And so they kicked the Jesuits out and they made an edict of religious toleration in France so that the Protestants could live in peace. So that this constant war between Protestants and Catholics would come to an end and that the nation could prosper for all but everybody's benefit. The Edict of Nantes brought a temporary religious peace. And it says, This edict gave freedom of worship to all Christians and was vehemently opposed by the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Catholic Church, particularly the Vatican and the Jesuit order, they do not want peace. They want the heretics exterminated, annihilated, and extirpated. It is their divine prerogative to rid the world of quote-unquote heresy and make the world Catholic. That is their goal. And it says, Paris writes, on the 16th of May, 1610, on the eve of his campaign against Austria, he, that is Henry IV, was murdered by Rabelais in his own chamber. Unquote. The entire plot was set up by the Jesuits. The Duke of Eppeman, who made the king read a letter while the assassin was lying in wait, was a notorious friend of the Jesuits. And Michelet has proved that they knew of this plot. Rabelac had been given confession of his plans to the Jesuit father de Bigny just before the assassination. There's that gluttonous use of the confessional box to clear one's conscience and to have his sin atoned even before he commits regicide. This is the what was referred to earlier as the gluttonous use of the confessional box. If that was the you know the sanctity of the of the confessional was the lame brained uh, defense made by Henry Garnett, and it 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 is how the Jesuits twist their own minds into believing that what they're doing is holy and that they may commit any crime, if it benefits the Roman Catholic Church, and especially if they can confess that crime in a confessional box is protected by the sanctity of it as a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church, and they can obtain absolution and cooperation by the priest. So that's the function of the confessional box in the Roman Catholic Church. Information gathering and 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 conscience allaying services that the priests give to the to the sinful penitent who may have a bomb in his pocket ready to walk out of the church after confessional and commit a heinous crime. All right, Ravillac had given confession of his plans to the Jesuit father de, de Bigny just before the assassination and when the judges interrogated this Jesuit priest as to why he did not reveal his uh, his knowledge of the plot beforehand, he merely replied that God had given him the gift, the miraculous gift, to forget immediately what he had heard in the confessional, unquote. So there you go again, another priest claiming this divine ability to, to automatically forget what he hears in the confessional after he gives absolution, this gluttonous use of the confessional, the sanctity of the confessional, and nowhere in God's word, nowhere in the laws of God, is a confessional box even mentioned. Why? Because he is our confessor. No man forms an intermediary between sinful man and the merciful throne of Christ. And because of this fabrication of the Jesuits called the confessional box, with the world now suffers the bloodshed as a result of violently disobeying God's law and foisting this lie upon humanity, 
a lie which soon is going to pollute what's left of the ecumenical evangelibelly churches in this country. Yes, we're all becoming Catholic by the day. This new world order is a Roman Catholic order. The world is becoming Catholic, and the churches are where that change is taking place. And that's why I repeatedly tell people, get out of the churches. Worship God according to the Holy Spirit and the, and, and the written word of God. Worship him in spirit and in truth and get out of this abomination that is called a church, for crying out loud, of all things. We need to get back to the first century Christian beliefs and practices, put away all of our pagan Roman traditions, the ones we love so much, Christmas and Easter and Sunday, and, 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 and become of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then receive God's blessing. Obedience is rewarded by wisdom, and that wisdom comes from the Scriptures. If you can't understand the Scriptures, it's because you're holding out on the Lord. Forsake your sin, and He will open your heart and your mind to be able to understand the Scriptures. If you find the Bible difficult to to read and believe and understand, simply obey the Lord. Forgive, uh, for, forsake your sins, and he will reward you with blessings from on high, and that's simply understanding the words that he wrote in, in his own book. If you want to understand the scriptures, put the sin out of your life. It's just as simple as that. Obedience is rewarded of the Father. He's no different than our natural fathers. If we disobey, he withholds. But if we obey, he showers us with blessing. And where is that blessing most best realized? In being able to understand him. And he's only understood out of his book. He gave us this book to be read and understood. All right. Ravillac had given confession of his plans to the Jesuit father, DeBigny, just before the assassination and when the judges interrogated this Jesuit priest as to why not, he did not reveal his knowledge of the plot beforehand, he merely replied that God given him this miraculous ability to immediately forget everything that he heard in the confessional. What a load! Now, in fact, Ravillac later confessed to having been inspired by the writings of Jesuit fathers Mariana and Suarez. These two Jesuits sanctioned the murder of heretic tyrants. Protestant kings. Heretic tyrants means Protestant kings. Or kings uh, that were not obedient to the Pope. You see, the Pope puts himself on God's holy throne, you see. If, If one of the Pope's kings doesn't do what he's told, the Pope withholds. But if the if the papal king obeys the Pope, then the Pope showers him with blessing, see? He truly thinks he is God. And if you're a Protestant sitting on the throne, if you've somehow managed to wrestle a throne away from the Pope, God have mercy, because the Pope certainly won't. And he'll use his Jesuits to get you off of that throne, even if he has to render you uh, ambient temperature. And that's been repeated over and over and over in history, even in the United States. Right after. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. 
If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Valuable information. Now back to Ravelac who later confessed to having been inspired by the writings of Jesuit fathers Mariana and Suarez, these two Jesuits sanctioned the murder of heretic tyrants. That's right. Heads of state who are regarded, by, who are regarded as heretics by the Jesuit order or by the Vatican, either one, are sanctioned for murder. And it said the Jesuit doctor... Philosac, Ravillac's father confessor, quote, God be thanked, Ravillac has died like a saint. I heard his confession, and it is certain that he is in paradise. The sacrament of confession infallibly works out to salvation, which conducts straightway to paradise, where he is now. Ravillac will repose in the bosom of Abraham, unquote. So there you have it. If you commit a heinous crime of murder, regicide, assassination, in the name of the Roman Catholic Church, you automatically become a saint and you're reposed to the bosom of Abraham. That is the the Church of Antichrist. Let there be no doubt the Antichrist prophecies in the Bible, everything that describes the biblical Antichrist is found in the papacy. Now, <clears throat> continuing, after Henry's death, the, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes drove half a million Protestants into exile. 
And I'll just tell you, it it uh, it was a bloody exile. God's people always suffer. The, the bloodshed of Rome every time the Vatican chooses to. And that's about to happen in this country. Uh, a massive scale, the likeness of the uh, St. Bartholomew's Massacre is about to happen in this country. That's why I've named this program Inquisition Update. And I'm no prophet of God. I've never heard directly a voice from the Lord, Thus saith the Lord, tell my people thus and so. Never happened. But I don't need to hear that voice. His voice is clearly speaking to me from the Scriptures and from history. And anybody with any wits about him and any understanding of the Scripture and history can clearly see what's going to happen in this country. And God's people just simply are not prepared. They think they're going to be raptured out. You'll be raptured out in a coffin after they lop your head off in a guillotine. I'm sorry for those who are so desperately clinging to the hope, so-called the blessed hope of Christianity, that we all be raptured out at the last minute. I have to ask you something. Where was the rapture for the first century Christians? Those who were fed to the lions by the Romans. Where was the rapture for the Waldenses and the Albigenses and the Huguenots and the and the, the Hussites and, the, and and all the saints of God throughout history? Where was the rapture for the Jews? Where was the rapture for the Protestants in the First and Second World War? Where was the rapture for the Orthodox during the 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 Ustashi siege of the former Yugoslavia to extirpate and annihilate? The, the Serbs, where was the rapture for them? Are Christians so sanctimonious here in the United States that we deserve to escape the wrath to come? I don't believe so. And Revelation chapter 13 confirms it. Now, I'm sorry if I've offended some of my dear listeners who believe in the rapture and who hope in the rapture, but the rapture teaches you not to be prepared for what's coming and to not recognize the sound of Roman hooves. Now, getting back to the book, it says, We must not forget also Jacques Clement, who on August 1st, 1589, stabbed King Henry III the Great in the streets of Paris in broad daylight. Kind of like the Kennedy assassination, right? Both of these assassins, Rablack and Clement, were recommended by the Jesuits and the, and the clergy for meritorious service and were even applauded from their pulpits. The images and pictures of the regicides were exhibited in the church chapels, placed on altars, and the assassins treated as though they were canonized saints. Clement was called an angel by the Jesuit priest Camelot. And Jesuit professor Guillard taught his students that Clement did nothing wrong. Quote, Jock Clement, wrote Gerard, has done a meritorious act inspired by the Holy Spirit. Unquote. And the Jesuit Mariana, whose writings had inspired Ravillac, cites Clement's claim is an example of the true type of tyrannicide. When there was the Jesuit uh, Balthazar, who was encouraged by the Jesuits at their college in Trevis to, the, to assassinate William I, Prince of Orange, for which act of regicide Catholic King Philip II of Spain rewarded Balthazar's parents with three country estates in Livermont, Hostal, and Dap Martin. Quotations such as these could be multiplied by the thousands. The Jesuits have executed deeds of regicides many times over, assassination being next to poisoning the most favored method of choice. Volumes of such Jesuit crimes could easily be compiled ad nauseum. History reveals that in almost every instance the real cause of seditions, tumults, revolutions, disorder in France, Spain, Portugal, 
was to be found in the Jesuits. And I'll just add, so is World War One, World War Two, and the current world war that is about to break forth. Read for yourself the grim assessment of one of the former pupils, the abbot Marcet de la Roche-Arnaud, who spent eight years in a Jesuit college. Quote, how can any honest man live among them? Do you wish to excite trouble, to provoke revolution, to produce the total ruin of your country? Call in the Jesuits, unquote. And that's what America has done. Called in the Jesuits, have allowed them to conduct their diabolical business unmolested in this country since before the revolution, before the Revolutionary War. And that's why we're suffering today. And that's why we've suffered wars, papal proxy wars. Do you know the United States has never fought a war for its own, for its own defense? To protect our own rights and liberties? We've never fought a war for our own benefit. Every war that's ever been fought by the United States has been fought at the behest of the Pope to achieve his aims. Who most benefited by the wars fought by the United States? The Vatican. And if you understand that, if you'll do your own research, if you begin to understand this, then you can understand Revelation chapter 13 and of whom it speaks. Now, their grand maxim, says J.A. Wiley, wherever they are, is agitate, agitate. And he adds, if despotisms will not serve them, their maxim is to demoralize society, to render government impossible. Is that not what we're seeing in this country today? A totally immoral society, no restraint, no regard for God's law, adultery, rape, incest, Pornography, alcohol, drugs, crime, killing, filth from morning through noon till night. Who demoralized this society? J.A. Wiley just told us. He said their grand maxim, wherever they are, is agitate, agitate. And he add, quote, if despotisms will not serve them. Did you know the Pope considers the United States a despotism? Because it won't allow the union of church and state. It promotes freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, freedom to keep and bear arms, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of your conscience and the written word of God. That's despotism according to the Pope. So how did they overthrow these Protestant governments, they demoralize the society. And that's exactly what they've done in this country. You want to know where the drugs come from? It was the Jesuits who 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 fought the opium wars in China. It was the Jesuit it's the Jesuits who are behind the, the the clandestine opium crops around the world. That's why the United States is in Afghanistan right now. The Taliban wants to mow down all that immoral opium growing in the fields over there. Now, I'm not defending the Taliban. But would you threaten the Pope's drug, uh, drug supplies with which he demoralizes society? so that he can claim to be the great spiritual leader of the world, when you start taking those those diabolical, sinful resources away from the Pope, he wage war against you. And he'll use a, a heretic Protestant nation to do it, called the United States of America. We're not in Afghanistan for our own benefit. We're in Afghanistan for the Pope's benefit. That's his source of revenue, and that's the way he demoralizes our society. That opium crop is essential to bringing the papacy to world supremacy. The CIA and the Vatican work together to keep the drugs flowing into this country so they can foment their wars and finance their weapons 
to kill innocent people that have not a clue what's really going on. That's how he overthrows despotisms, by demoralizing their society, and that's exactly what they did in this country, and they simply rendered government impossible. And from the resulting chaos to remodel the world anew in the Pope's own image. There you have it. There's the recipe for the New World Order. Order out of chaos. New World, Papal, Vatican, Jesuit-led, New World Order out of the chaos that they create in the world. It's easy. And it makes sense. And he says, thus we see that like their more openly violent offshoot in Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin, the Jesuits are prepared to talk peace when it serves them, but are ready for war when it does not. Reader, the Jesuits are men of the most subtle and diabolical industry, initiated into all the mysteries of hell, and within their camp are vipers, scorpions, and every other venomous thing. But since this opinion may be seen by some as eccentric, I shall confirm it by sufficient authority of diverse authors, so that I may be better, so that I may better clear it from the prejudice of the upstart or the incredulous mind. He's talking about people who are not familiar with the clear and convincing evidence assembled over hundreds of years by various authors. It sounds incredulous to those who are prejudiced of mind who, who, or who are just upstarts and have never heard of these things before. And he says, I assure you, I do not overstate the matter. Read for yourself this desperate appeal from Privy Councilors Lord Suffolk, Salisbury, and Morton to Lord Falkland and Lord Deputy of Ireland in a letter dated March 2nd, 1627, quote, the Jesuits be not only a subtle society, but also an audacious sort of people, fearing no punishment, no, not the halter itself. That's the gallows, the halter, the gallows. They don't even fear the gallows. So that we are at a non-plus, or we're perplexed about how to banish or to devise a means to chase away these wasps from His Majesty's dominion. Unquote. G. B. Nicolini, the great historian, seconds that testimony. He says, quote, No danger, not even that of death, can deter a Jesuit from following his projects when once they are considered profitable to the order or necessary to avenge it of its enemies. The moment they could return from exile, the instant they were set free, they returned to their plots and intrigues with unabated ardor and a most wonderful obstinacy, unquote. Reader, there's more than mere rhetoric in these two sentences, than in a whole library of sermons. And indeed, if those sentences were understood by the readers of the, with the same emphasis as they are delivered by the author G.B. Nicolini, we needed not any more instructions in this volume on the character and mach machinations of the Jesuits. That's the end of chapter four. Very popular, a very powerful chapter about the history, the bloody diabolical history of the Jesuit order. A history that fully explains the assassination of all of our presidents. Including their own, John F. Kennedy. And next Thursday on the broadcast, Lord willing, uh, Brother Bill Hughes, the author of the book The Secret Terrorist and the Enemy Unmasked, will join me again. We'll continue our discussion about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And if you've never heard the truth about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, please tune in next Thursday. But now I'll begin with what little time we have left in the broadcast with Chapter 5 of this magnificent one-stop shopping 
book. If you want to understand what's happening in the world, particularly in the United States, get this book, Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. Get it from Lux Verbi Books, L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I dot O-R-G. Order it online. Now, here's a quote from King James I, King of England. He says, imposters under a veil of piety, wolves in sheep's clothing, troublers of the public peace, men of diabolical industry, uh, serpents, and very cockademons, of whom all should be aware and fly from them. That's King James I of England. He knew full well about the Jesuit order. Why don't we know anything about the Jesuit order? Stay tuned, and you'll know plenty. The title of this chapter is The Art of Evil, The Moral Theology of the Jesuits. Now we're getting to the very bowels of the Jesuit order. What makes them so diabolical? The author writes, We leave behind for a moment the bloody tracks of Jesuitism and come now to consider their moral theology, the rules of engagement of the Society of Jesus. One ex-pupil of the Jesuits who had studied under them for eight years said of this former, of, of his former masters, quote, the objective of the disciples of Loyola is to acquire the highest offices of state for the men they have poisoned with their maxims. Unquote. Let me read it again. Let it sink into the marrow of your bones. The objective of the disciples of Loyola, the Jesuit priests, is to acquire the highest offices of state for the men they have poisoned with their factions. And that explains Ronald Reagan reestablishing formal diplomatic relations with the Vatican, bringing this scourge of Romanism to mainstream government control, unhindered, and almost not even veiled. You have his successor, George H.W. Bush. Oh, by the way, Ronald Reagan was a Knight of Malta honorary. He's from an Irish, an, a long line of Irish Roman Catholics, Ronnie Reagan was. And he was an honorary 33rd degree Freemason. So twice honored by the Jesuits, Knight of Malta and 33rd degree Freemason. And we have a successor, George H.W. Bush, comes from the, the Stewart family, who were run off the, the, the British throne, had to seek exile in Europe on the mainland from assassination. Catholic Paul, the Stewart family, the blue bloods of Europe, Related to the Stuart family, he was a, a Skull and Bones member and a Knight of the Most Holy, Holy Eucharist. If you've never heard that, I'll explain that some other time. And he ruled this country for his little God in Rome, did his best to overthrow our Constitution. He even served in the CIA for a long time, Catholics in action. And then his successor, George, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, Bill Jesuit Clinton, Oxford trained, Georgetown trained, and he, like his predecessors, followed the Jesuit order. And then little George W., just a spitting image of his old man, and now we have Barack Obama, who's not even a citizen of this country. Not a natural-born citizen, he's not. And he's not qualified to be president. Another complete admission that the Constitution has no power anymore in this country. What are the maxims of these people? To put Jesuit-trained robots in the highest offices of our land. And that's exactly what they've done. Now, what are the maxims of the Jesuits that so pollute the minds of men 
that they would serve the biblical Antichrist and be willing to kill God's people. If any man desires to understand what kind of being a Jesuit really is, let him read their moral theology. The moral theology of the Jesuits can be summed up in the three great rules which they direct all their affairs and great enterprises. Number one, that the end justifies the means. In other words, by any means necessary. Number two, that it is safe to do any action if it be probably right, although it may be more probably wrong. Let me read that again. If it's safe to do any action, if it be probably right, although it may be more probably wrong. So, in other words, if you can find any possibility, even by twisting your neurons into a knot of seeing anything righteous in a diabolical effort, then it's probably all right. Number three that if one knows how to direct the intention aright, using good intentions, there's no need whatever. It's moral character, which one may not do. I mean, it's all about the intentions. I dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Nagasaki, and I killed hundreds of thousands of innocent people, but I had good intentions. They had good intentions when they killed President John F. Kennedy, too. And that's only scratching the surface. (sighs) Sorry this hour ended so quickly. I'll continue with the book tomorrow. Come back and see us here at Inquisition Update. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. We'll talk about it more on the program tomorrow. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? 
Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.